Happy Sabbath. Uh, we are continuing our um, health presentations with our um, youth health club. And we have three young ladies today here, and they are going to present themselves to you. Victoria. Ellie. Alessia. Uh, thank you so much for being part of uh, our presentations, and I want to thank you to thank all those that came to me and appreciated the young kids. And I want to encourage you to go to them. And also, I had other parents or kids coming to me, and uh, this is open for everyone. We do not have favorites. We love everybody to be involved. So you can come to me, or you can go to Nikki, or to any of the Sabbath school as the teachers. So we are continuing our series about health. And today we are going to talk about foods. What was the original diet in the Garden of Eden? And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon all the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for food. Genesis 1.29 speaks of a diet of fruits, grains, nuts, and legumes. The original diet was vegan. What are the majority Americans eating today? A common diet today contains animal products, processed foods, saturated fat, and fried foods. What are the consequences of this diet? The Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluations says, states that better eating could prevent one in five deaths worldwide. Bad diet is responsible for more deaths than smoking. Consequences of unhealthy diet in the last 30 years Obesity rates have doubled in adults, tripled in children, and quadrupled in adolescents. Ellen White warned in 1869, grains and fruits prepared free from grease and in as natural condition as possible should be the food for the tables of all. The Saving Health, page 78. Today we are going to present the most cultivated vegetable in the world, the potato, and the most cultivated grain in the world, the wheat. In the Inca Indians, Andes of Peru, were the first to cultivate potatoes. In 1536, Spanish conquistadors in Peru discovered the flavors in, of the potatoes and transported them to Europe, where it took only 40 years to spread all over the continent. Potatoes contain vitamin C and B6, niacin, folate. Potatoes contain minerals, zinc, potassium, magnesium, mm, manganese, and phosphor. They contain substances that prevent osteoporosis, maintain heart, health and reduce the risk of infection. Potatoes are a good source of fiber, which can help you lose weight by keeping you full longer. Recent studies show that cooked and cooled potatoes contain high levels of racine starch. Racine starch processed through a small intestine without being digested, lowering the blood sugar. Even diabetics can eat potatoes in this form. Many people think of potatoes as a fattening food, but they are not. It is the fat added in processing and in the toppings for potatoes, such as butter, sour cream, mayonnaise, or gravy, that give the, them this bad reputation. Three ounces of fried potatoes are 345 calories. Three ounces of hash browns are 240 calories. Three ounces of boiled potatoes are 85 calories. Potato chick, 
chips take the unhealthy processing to an extreme. Three ounces of chips contain 450 calories and 30 grams of fat, equal with four tablespoons of oil. A plain, fresh baked potato has no fat. Did you, did you know that wheat is the most important cereal in the world? Mainly in the form of bread and noodles. Wheat nourishes more people than any other grain. The history of wheat. Wheat is one of the oldest cultivated grains. It was first grown in Asia 6,000 years ago. It was used by the Egyptians and Romans. It was brought to America by the European settlers in the 1700s. A grain of wheat is made up of bran, an outer cover the most nutritious part, rich in fiber, vitamins, and minerals. Embryo, embryo, the wheat germ, also rich in fiber, vitamins, and minerals. Endosperm, innermost layer, composed of starch and a small amount of protein. What's wrong with white bread and white pasta? The endosperm of wheat contains mostly starch and is and it is the only part used in making white flour. Ironically, the nutritious bran and wheat germ are removed during the milling process, are used for animal feed. White bread and white pasta are missing the minerals and vitamins and the most important fiber con contained in the bran and wheat germ. Let's compare the fiber content. A slice of white bread contains half a gram of germ. A slice of whole wheat bread contains as much as four grams of fiber, eight times more than white bread. Is, isn't bread fattening? It isn't the bread that's fattening, but what's done to it. A slice of bread can has 70 calories, no more than an apple. If slathered with peanut butter and jam, the slice can pack close to 300 calories. Scientists at the New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center found that wheat bran can have a beneficial effect on people with colon cancer. The effect is due to the fiber in the bran. Use whole wheat bread instead of white bread. We want to encourage everyone to, to eat the bread that is healthiest for us. And here is a quotation from Ellen White which uh, explains that in the process of milling of bread, the white uh, flour is losing all the nutritious part. And she's saying, for using the bread making, the super fine flour is not the best. Its use is not helpful. Fine flour is lacking nutritive elements to be found in bread made from the whole wheat. It is a frequent cause of constipation and other unhelpful, unhelpful conditions. Isn't this interesting? She was not a doctor and she knew what's what the effect of the um, white flour to the body. We encourage you to eat whole wheat bread and to um, start using more potatoes. This is the potato state. Idaho is the potato state. We even have a museum here. And uh, just um, thank you so much for your, your encouragement for um, our uh, health or club. Thank you. Good morning, Christian patriots. How many of you believe there's a crisis going on right now in this world? And the whole world is involved in this. There's a great controversy going on. Well, very shortly, to next week, you can see last week we had uh, 3,500 great controversies handed out, but they had still 1,500 left over. What are we going to do with those 1,500 great controversies? I'll tell you what we're going to do with them. You see, this, you see it up there on the screen? There is a great awakening happening. It's going all over the United States, and it's going to happen next week in Post Falls. Mike Lindell, General Flynn, the Trump sons are all going to be there, and they're going to be trying to reach the people. So this controversy is important. They have part of the story. 
They're trying to save America and get America going again. But at the same time, they're missing a great part of it, aren't they? And that's our job as Christian patriots. It's all about Jesus. Am I agreeable on that one? But what we have to do is we have to put our faith in action. So next week on the 16th and the 17th, look at this picture. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for who? He's a time like Nebuchadnezzar was for a specific reason. And this is the time for us today. We are facing these major crises, and so we have to find a people who are willing to put their faith in action. Not sit down, but get out there and share. So next week, we're going to rally people together here. For those who signed up my little chart here that I have, I'll be passing around in the pews, to go down on Friday, probably won't even have to go Sabbath. My wife and I have given out 200 great controversies in a couple hours at Walmart. And we have, if we have even 10 people, that's only 150. So a piece of cake for us. But the experience is what we're looking for. We want to be able to come back here for Sabbath and share a little bit of an experience that we did down at the Speedway. These people's hearts are warm. They're wide open right now. And they're hungry and they're confused. And we have the answer for them. So if you're willing to be able to give out the great controversy, patriots in America, how fighting for your country has taken a new meaning not just for our country, but also for the world. And so as this controversy goes on, we are the people with the truths about Christ, the issues that we have to deal with, and we have that opportunity. So I'm asking you, I'll be passing this out, if you'll be willing to go down and pass out a few of these controversies and get the experience that will boost your faith, we do, still, we the people must trust the Lord. And the Bible is crucial today that we need to know. So I'm going to pass this out starting out down here. If you're willing to help out, uh, put your name and your email and please print it so they don't write it. I know how legibly some people write, myself included. I'll be passing this thing out and uh, be contacting me for the information. And we'll go around hopefully next Friday and have a nice crew of people to be willing to put their faith on the line. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Michael Lee. And I'm Lance Robbins. And we have a brand new Sabbath School class that actually started today, but Lance, I was a little bit lonely today. How did you feel? Well, I thought I was good company. I don't know. Well, you were good company, but we're looking for some more uh, people to come populate our Sabbath School class. Our target demographic is 18 to 30, but if you are 18 to 30 in your mind, you're welcome to come. Uh, so. We would love to see you there. We are studying the book of Esther. So if you or someone you know uh, falls in that age range, mentally or physically, please come join us. We are in this uh, corner room right across from the women's bathroom. We'll see you guys next week. Good morning. Good morning, Ten Point and the world beyond on the Internet. The youth class is doing your praise music this morning, and uh, so we'd like to have you join us for the uh, first one being Mansion Over the Hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver a little gold, but in that city where the ransom will shine, I got a gold one, that silver line. I got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow. And though I find here no 
permanent dwelling. I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never roam. And someday under we'll never more wander but walk on street see all these faces and I want to see them there. Our next is Redeemed. It's in your hymnal number 337. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed to his infinite mercy. His child and Closer walk, if you would stand with us and sing just a closer walk with thee.
Front and kneel up here. If you have a special request you'd like to come up the front and pray, you're welcome to do that. Father, we bow before you, a people called out. You've asked us to come and be a different people, a people who love you and in doing so love each other. Lord, we are here because we aren't worthy. We're here because we love you and we want to serve you. Lord, there's many things that are weighing on our hearts, whether it's our immediate family or ourselves or people around us. Lord, you know what is hurting our hearts, what's bothering us. What's, you know our praises and our waking and our going to bed. You know what's going on in our lives, Lord, but you've asked us to come to you because you love us and you want us to be close to you. Lord, there's, there's a fire going on up north. And there's a lot of people that are at risk of losing their places. And Lord, they're, they're concerned. But as in the time of old, Lord, you are there for them. And I ask that you give them faith to trust in you that whatever happens, you will be there for them. Lord, we also pray for Mr. Meisner. He's not doing well. You know him. You know his family. You know what is best. Lord, we pray that your will be done in his life and his family's life. And if it's your will, Lord, we pray for healing. Many things are weighing on us, Lord, but you've granted us eternal life which outweighs anything that we have in front of us now. Help us to keep hope and faith in you that you will pull us through. In your name, amen.
It's been requested of me to ask that we make room for more people. So if, you, if there's space between you and somebody else, feel free to get a little more comfortable. Welcome to come down and find yourself a seat here in front of the stage. Testing. Testing, one, two, three. One, two, three. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. It's on here, yeah. Check, check, check. Good morning. Testing, testing. Thank you, Caden. All right. If you didn't hear me already, come on down, collect those dollars, put them in the chest here in the front, and find a seat. Good job, Nola. Okay, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. good. All right. If your brother, how many of you have a brother? If your brother said, trust me, would you trust your brother? Oh, hearing a lot of mixed answers. All right, if you have a sister and your sister said, oh, come on, trust me. No. Oh, no? Okay, now here's a hard one. What about if the person telling the children's story says, trust me? Mmm. What if they have a big bag of water and they said, trust me? No, I need somebody who will trust me. Okay, yeah, come up here. I promise I won't get you wet, okay? Do you trust me? You do, okay. So if I hold the bag over your head, you trust me that I won't get you wet. Okay, let's see, you got a sharp one? Okay, what if I poke a hole in the bag? Do you trust me? You do? No, not really, but Are you sure? I won't get you wet. <gasps> what if I poke another hole in the bag? Oh, you trust me. Should I do another one? 
I won't get you wet, trust me. Look at that. You're not getting wet. Take it out. No, no, no. I better not take it out. All right. So, is it easy to trust God? What about when hard things come? Mm, and it feels like you're going to get a hole poked in you. Something's hard, like, oh, my friend hurt my feelings, and I don't know if I can feel better. And you pray, and you pray, and then you do feel better. Jesus helps you. And you start to feel like, no matter what, you can trust him. Okay, hang on, don't go away. I like the white color that you're wearing. Now, if I put this over your head and said, trust me, you won't get wet, and I'm going to poke a hole in it, do you trust me? Why do you trust me? Because you did it the first time. I did it before, didn't I? It worked out okay? Yes, even though that's painful. So, let me ask you this question. Does God ask you, boys and girls, trust me, without giving you a reason to trust him? Mm, that's a hard question, because a lot of times we think we should trust God no matter what, and that's true, but God always gives us proof that he is trustworthy. We could probably read a story about David defeating a giant. And that would be building our trust in him, wouldn't we? And when our animal got lost and it came back after we prayed, whoa! <laughs> Story went wrong. Well, I'm not sure how to recover from that one. <laughs> God gives us reasons to trust him. And if we look back through the Bible, and through our lives, we can see evidence that time and time again, he has been trustworthy. God doesn't ask us to trust him just because he's God, but because he has been faithful. From the beginning of history, all through the Bible, all through our lives, he's been faithful to us. And he will continue to be faithful to you. And you know what? He might ask you to do something that sure seems like, I don't know about this. I don't know if I can trust him. But we can look back and we can see his faithfulness. And we can trust Jesus. All right, you may go back to your seats. Happy Sabbath. All right. At least a couple of people are awake. Happy Sabbath. All right. It's wonderful to be here in the house of God. And uh, this is a special Sabbath this week. Uh, our guest speaker is David Jameson, and his wife, Chandra, is here today. And uh, he's going to be bringing us the word. Now, uh, Elder Jameson has been in the pastoral ministry for 36 years, and uh, last 20 years he's been a pastor uh, up in Canada. Him and his wife are both Canadian, born and raised. Uh, they have, uh, he's been in the conference, like I said, in the ministry for 36 years, and he's actually been a conference president before uh, up in Canada when he was 36 years old. But because he had little kids, they decided to focus on those children. He went to the pastoral ministry and so we're delighted to have him uh, here with us today. They have four grown children that all live in the United States, <laughs> and they're all in the church. Praise the Lord. We had an opportunity to get to know him. He spoke last night, and if you didn't see that, it was an outstanding sermon, so please uh, check it out on our YouTube channel. Uh, but the elders, we had an opportunity to meet with them and discuss 
with him and some of the other church leadership, and it was an amazing meeting, and I can say I'm really excited about the direction our conference is taking. Uh, we want to work together with our conference uh, to finish the work that God has called us. Amen? One of those things uh, is also the 40 Days of Prayer Initiative, and if you have not been attending a prayer meeting, they are doing the 40 Days of Prayer, and if you haven't signed up for the UCC emails, you can get those. We're spending 40 days praying for God's leading in our conference, and that's going to finish with the conference uh, representatives from all the churches coming together to really put together a vision uh, for the conference. So thank you, Elder Jameson, for putting that together. Right now, we have the opportunity to give God a small portion of what he's blessed us with in our tithes and offerings. The loose offerings today will go for the world church. Amen? We belong to a world church, and so we in the United States, uh, the monies that you donate and the loose offerings will help spread the gospel around the world. Will the deacons please stand? Father in heaven, thank you for the blessings you've given us. Lord, we're eager to see you, and we're eager to see the work that you've called us to do be finished. Help the funds that are collected today be used for that purpose to help further your work. In your name we pray, amen. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 through 27. Sorry, Matthew 14, verses 23 through 27. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain to, by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. 
But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Good morning. First, I want to thank everybody for their love and kindness and helping me to have a great visit every time I come. There's a very prominent name in gospel music, and that's Dottie Rambo. She wrote hundreds of tributes to the Lord in song. So we have combined a couple of those songs into a little medley that we'd like to share today and hope that the words will be a blessing. He didn't promise that I would never stumble, but he did say he'd be there if I fall. He didn't tell me he'd hear complaints I whisper, but he did say he'd hear me if I call. If that isn't love, oh. <laughs> the ocean is dry. And there are no stars in the sky. And the sparrow can't fly. If that isn't love, then heaven's just a myth. And there's no feeling like this. If that isn't love, promises, promises, and all of them true. He's done exactly what he said he would do. He didn't tell me my heart would not be broken, but he did say, He'd mend it again If that isn't love The ocean is dry And there are no stars in the sky And the sparrow can't fly if that isn't love, then heaven's just a myth. And there's no feeling like this. If that isn't love, he left the splendor of heaven knowing his destiny was the lonely hill of Golgotha there to lay down his life for me if that isn't love then heaven's just a myth And there's no feeling like this If that isn't love Even in death he remembered 
the, the thief hanging by his side. He spoke with love and compassion as he promised in paradise. If that isn't love, the ocean is dry, and there's no stars in the sky, and the sparrow can't fly, if that isn't love, then heaven's just a myth. And there's no feeling like this If that isn't love It had to be love It had to be Thank you, Lorraine and Janice. That was beautiful. If that isn't love. What a privilege it is to be here to worship with you at the Sandpoint Church today. I feel energy here. I feel that God has blessed your congregation in so many ways. Just to see all of the children trusting Lance for that children's story, all of them up here, that was very, very special. And so my wife, Chandra, and I have been here in the Upper Columbia Conference for all of eight months. For the last 20 years, we were pastoring a church in the valley in Langley, British Columbia, Canada. And when the leadership of the NPUC called and said, would you consider uh, coming to the Upper Columbia Conference? I said, no. One of the gentlemen said that was the wrong answer and said, would you pray about it for a week? I said, okay. I pray, well, yes, it could be 40 days. It was a week that they asked for, and then they called and said, would you like to come? And I said, no. <laughs> we were being very blessed in ministry at Church in the Valley. Our one focus was to reach out to lost men and women and boys and girls for the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and to share the most wonderful message in the entire world, which I've always believed is the Seventh-day Adventist message when it's rightly understood everyone on the planet needs to have an opportunity to hear about the Jesus that we serve. And so I was having a lot of fun there in ministry and didn't want to come anywhere other than to be there and to continue doing what we were doing in very innovative ways in reaching out to the community through community services programs and building friendships and seeing people respond and falling in love with Jesus, being baptized and disciples. So I said no. But for the next 10 days, I couldn't live with myself. I just couldn't shake it. And I did something that I've never done in my entire married life. I made a decision without consulting my wife. So you know this is major, right? We've discussed everything, but on this occasion, I knew that this time around, it was going to be between me and the Lord, because I feel I've always gone where the Lord has called, from east to west in Canada, 
and now here in the United States after having had opportunity to come to the U.S. before and have said no. But this time around, I felt God was calling, so I called back the North Pacific Union Conference president and said, John, please tell me that that position is already filled. He said, David, it's not. I'm delighted you've called. What's on your mind? And I said, well, John, I haven't been able to shake this. I don't know why. I was hoping you were going to tell me it was filled, and I had no reason to even think about it again. But it seems like if it's the will of the executive committee, in Upper Columbia Conference, I feel God is telling me I need to be open to coming and serving. And so that's the story. And so I am here simply as David. I am a sinner just like you, but saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And from the very beginning of my journey, which I say was when I was 19 years of age, becoming a Seventh-day Adventist, I got all of the head knowledge that you could possibly get about Daniel and Revelation, and I loved it. But something happened to me as well, and I shared it last evening, I'll share it again this morning. After the evangelistic meetings on a Friday evening in particular, and after all weekend long, I started listening to Christian music. I didn't even know what it was. Went to a bookstore, they gave me a cassette of a gentleman by the name of B.J. Thomas who just had his own conversion experience, and he was singing songs like, what a difference you've made in my life. And I'm saying to myself, I can relate to that. What a difference Jesus was making in my life. He became my sunshine day and night. And so I love to lift up Jesus. Last night I shared a message entitled, It's All About Jesus. It really is. That's the only way that you and I are going to get to those mansions that we were singing about through Jesus. And when you had your prayer song this morning, you said that, Lord, we want to see who? Jesus. Do you really want to see Jesus today? Amen. Well, I'd like to share a message with you entitled, How to Withstand the Storms of Life with Jesus. And I know there are a lot of children here and a lot of people who are young at heart, and so I want to challenge the children and anyone else who's young at heart. I've already said the name of Jesus I don't know how many times, but from this moment on, I'd like to challenge anyone who wishes to accept the challenge to write down the number of times we say the name Jesus in this sermon message. Would you do that? Write down the number of times and then come and tell me afterwards because we want to uplift Jesus today higher and higher to the highest heaven. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you that we can come into this place to worship you today with all of our hearts, and we open ourselves up to you, the amazing, incredible, infinite God of the galaxies. May you come and speak to us as we listen today. We really do want to see your son, Jesus. We want him to change our hearts and lives today. That's why we've come. Move through the mighty power of your Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Let me begin by asking you this question. Have you ever gone through a major storm in your life? Think about your life's journey, and you'll likely say, if you've been around for a few decades, you've gone through several major storms in your life. As I looked at your church bulletin this morning, I see there are seven people there in your 
prayer request section who are going through major storms, dealing with cancer and many other things. We all go through storms in life. If we are human, we need to expect that there will indeed be storms. But let me ask you this, has your life ever gone from calm to chaos in a single moment? I think of my own experience, and I think of several times already where I was maybe driving down the road and happy and singing, and all of a sudden I get a telephone call, and everything changes in a split second, and the calmness goes to chaos. Maybe you've had that kind of experience. And if you have, maybe you can relate to the story of Chippy the parakeet. And I share this story with you, especially for the kids. Chippy never saw it coming. He was simply sitting there on his perch in his birdcage. He was whistling, he was singing, it was a wonderful day, except for one thing. His owner decided that she was going to vacuum his cage that day. She went over to the closet, she pulled out the vacuum cleaner, she plugged it in, she began to bring the hose closer to the cage, opened the cage door, turned on the vacuum, put the nozzle of the vacuum into the cage, and all of a sudden her phone rang. She reached for the phone, and when she did, she heard <laughs> She looked back in the cage, and Chippy was gone. Oh, no, she said. And then she did what you and I would do. She ran over and turned the vacuum cleaner off. She began to take the top of the vacuum cleaner off, and she reached inside to grab the vacuum cleaner bag. Have you ever done that? Oh, I know you have. And you know it's dirty, it's dusty, and a whole lot of other words that you can think of. And she rummaged through, and she found Chippy. He was still alive. No animals died in this story, okay? And she found Chippy. And then she had another brilliant idea, and you and I would do the same. She said, he's dirty. He, he, he needs to be cleaned. So she carried him down the hallway to her washroom, and she said, I need to wash him off. She held him in her left hand. She used her right hand to turn on one of the faucets. What's the right faucet typically? Cold cold water and so she puts him under there and he begins to look like that shivering freezing cold but he was clean then she had another brilliant idea that you and I would have she held him in her left hand she reached down and pulled open the drawer picked up something and plugged it in a hair dryer she didn't take any time to look at the settings to see if it was on hot and high. She just put it on poor Chippy and shh. And Chippy was just having the worst day of his entire life. He'd been sucked up, washed over, and blown dry all in the matter of a few minutes. Maybe you've gone through an experience like that in your life. That was actually a true story. Because a reporter asked Chippy's owner a few days later, how is Chippy doing? And she said, I don't know. He doesn't sing like he used to. He just sits there and stares all the time. I've gone through a few experiences in life when I felt just like that. And I know that a lot of people in this world have gone through storms in their lifetime to the point that they realize that the song can be taken out of the strongest and stoutest of Christian hearts sometimes. Sometimes life is very challenging. 
And the truth is that we are all collectively facing an incredible storm in our world right now. And as a result, many people are facing serious personal storms as well. Do you sense the uncertainty in our world today? As you look around, as you compare what you see to what you've learned in Bible prophecy, are you able to seriously sit down and assess things and say to yourself, Jesus is coming soon, isn't he? Do you believe that? This whole world is spinning out of control. It is not going to get better. And we need to be prepared. We need to, in the Upper Columbia Conference and here at the Sandpoint Church and beyond, we really need to come to that place where we say it's time for us to get serious about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and to prepare. But it's not just to prepare for ourselves and our families. We have a greater responsibility than that. We have a responsibility to help our neighbors, our coworkers, our extended family, people in our community that we don't even know. We have a responsibility to share this message with them so that they can be ready when Jesus comes as well. How do I know that? Because when I read the Bible about Jesus, I see him doing exactly that. And so if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 14, please do. I'm going to have verses here on the screen as well. Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verses 13 and 14, here's what it says. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Let me give you the background. Jesus was ministering to a very large crowd of people one day there by the Sea of Galilee. In fact, scholars will tell us that there may have been over 15,000 people there to listen to Jesus preach. And if that is correct, they also tell us back at that time there were only about 25,000 people there around the Sea of Galilee region during that time. So three-fifths of the population of the Sea of Galilee region were there to see Jesus. Why? Because I believe that whenever Jesus Jesus preached the word that people were drawn. He was one who spoke with authority. He was one who spoke with love. Jesus welcomed the children. He never turned anyone away. So people were attracted to him. But it says, when he heard what happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. While he was preaching that day, someone came up to him and shared some very terrible and tragic news that changed his day in a moment. He'd heard that his cousin, John the Baptist, had just come to an untimely death. And Jesus, reflecting on that, knew that he was also going to experience a death that was going to be cruel one that he was going to have to walk through very soon. And so it says he withdrew from the people by boat to a solitary place. But amazingly, it says, hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. And I don't know if you get the the drift of what happened here. He and the disciples got in a boat and sailed across the Sea of Galilee. But the crowd didn't want to let him go. They wanted to be in his presence. So they walked all the way around the Sea of Galilee so that when he landed again, there they were. And it says, when Jesus saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. And what I've discovered in my 40 years of being a Seventh-day Adventist is that Jesus is always moved with compassion towards people. It doesn't matter what their circumstance is. It doesn't matter what the choices are that they have made. Every single person is a child of the heavenly king. You who are parents, don't you love your children? 
you love them more than anything, you would say, well, that's how God feels about every single one of his children. We need to remember that every single person that we come in contact with and interact with is a child of the heavenly king. Last night I said it this way. Jesus loves the prostitute on the street equally as much as the parishioner in the pew or the pastor in the pulpit. It makes no difference. He loves all of his children. 82 times in the scriptures the word compassion is used. Seven times in the gospels the word compassion is used. And all seven times in the gospels it's essentially referring to how Jesus deals with people. He was moved with compassion toward people. Do you want your church to grow even more here? You don't have a lot of space here at the moment, do you? You need to have a second service. And if you're willing, you need to have a third service. Because there are lost men and women and boys and girls out there that we need to reach. But the churches that reach people are the churches that are moved with compassion toward people just like Jesus was. What does that mean, the Greek word for being moved with compassion? He was moved to the core of his being. He groaned when he saw what people were going through in the world around him. That's why he was there preaching. That's why he was teaching. That's why it says, and he healed their sick. He was wanting to bring help and healing and eternal happiness to anyone who would listen to his message. He was always moved with compassion toward people. And the churches that have that compassion towards people, they cannot help but grow. The story continues. It says, as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, they do not need to go away you give them something to eat. And they said, what? What are you talking about? We're out here in the middle of nowhere. There's 15,000 people. What are we going to feed them? Are you serious? Now, someone is getting a fellowship lunch ready here right now today, I believe. They probably already sent someone in to count how many people are here. They're maybe worried about the food and having enough. Well, the disciples knew they didn't have enough. In the next verse, we'll find out they said, we have here five loaves and two fishes. How are we going to feed all these people? And so when Jesus said, you feed them, I'd like to say it this way. Their jaws dropped. What? Their eyes popped, and their faith flopped. They did not know how to feed or reach the people. Did you get that? They did not know how they were going to do this. But Jesus knew. And so everywhere that I've gone in the Upper Columbia Conference, I've been able to share with people this thought from this story. I do not have a plan for how we're going to reach the people of the Upper Columbia Conference. It's going to take more than a human plan, isn't it? It's going to take a God-given plan. I don't have a plan. We have ideas. But we know someone who has a plan. That's why the very first thing that we've done, other than lifting up Jesus as we're preaching, we're inviting everyone in the Upper Columbia Conference and beyond to join us for 40 days of prayer and asking them to pray any time they want about anything that they want, but please, as you pray, to pray that God would give us throughout the entire Upper Columbia Conference and beyond his vision for how to reach people because he can accomplish more in the flash of an eye than we can accomplish with all of our lifetimes put together. We invite you to join us on that journey, and I'm glad that you already are. Every day, just simply say, God, they've asked us to pray for your vision to reach out to one more lost man, woman, and boy, and girl for your kingdom, and I'm praying that right now. Because I believe that God answers prayer. 
And I believe he delights when people say, you know, I want to get serious about the second coming, and I want to be a part of reaching out to lost men and women and boys and girls in Sandpoint and beyond. So they said, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. And Jesus said, bring them here to me. And he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks to God in advance before anything had ever happened. And he broke the loaves, and then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. And I'd like to suggest to you this morning that there are three secrets to surviving the storms of life. Whatever you may be going through in your life that's stormy right now, or when you do go through a storm in the future, the very first secret that we find in this story from the life of Jesus when he was going through a storm is to look up to the God who cares because he really does care for you and me. Do you know that people in the community they ask this old adage question, does anyone really care for me? That's the number one question of all time. Does anyone care? Is there a God who cares for me? And people will say, I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. The churches that are reaching out to their communities in caring ways are the churches that are making a difference for the Lord Jesus Christ. So whenever you're going through a storm, look up to the God who cares because he really does care. And if you want your church to grow, simply start caring for people. Do you know that there's another C word that we're often known by? Do you know what it is? We don't even like to say it, do we? But I share wherever I have the opportunity to go, all over this world, I've shared that when people refer to us as a C word that's negative, they don't choose that word. We do. How we act, how we believe, how we serve, determines how people are going to refer to us. If you want to be referred to as a caring church, then begin to care for people in incredible ways. It continues, it says, they all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. And the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. And I love it. How many disciples were there? 12. How many baskets that were left over? 12. Almost seems like God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? A sense of humor to share with them a reminder of the remainder that when God begins to work in your life, he works exceedingly abundantly above all that you might ask or imagine. He always visions bigger than we do. He always dreams bigger than we do. His ways are higher than our ways every single day time. Then it says immediately Jesus made the disciples to get into the boat and to go before him onto the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Jesus sent the crowd away. Why did he send the crowd away? Because the crowd said, if he can feed all these people, 15,000 people, out of a little boy's lunch, what can he do with an army? And we want to defeat the Romans who are occupying our territory. Let's take him and rush after him and lift him up and make him king of the Jews. And even his disciples got caught up in that sentiment. And Jesus dismissed them and sent them away because they had missed out on his message. They had missed out on the reason that he had came. Why had Jesus come to planet Earth? Luke 19 and verse 10 says, he came to seek and to save the lost. 
Jesus didn't come to defeat the Romans. Jesus didn't come to be involved in politics. Jesus came to defeat sin and the enemy, Satan, and to save you and me and anyone else who chooses his salvation. That's why he came. And so the story continues. Three secrets to surviving the storms of life. First of all, Jesus, he looked up to the God who cares. And secondly, he prayed to the God who hears because he really does hear and answer every single prayer. Now, do you believe that? There are a lot of people who say, I don't know about this thing called prayer. I don't seem to get any answers. But in Scripture, it says that he answers every single prayer. He may say yes. He may say no. He may say later. He may answer when we get to the other side. But he answers every single prayer. Do you believe in the power of prayer? Do you have a cell phone? Do you believe it works? Then you believe in Verizon or AT&T or Sprint or whomever. But let me ask you this. If man can develop a system of an internet, if man can develop a system of wireless technology so that we can text one another and we can call one another, then can't God do more and bigger things than that? Prayer is his technological way of allowing us to communicate with him, allowing for us to call upon his name and ask for his vision, to ask for his Holy Spirit's power, to ask for help and healing and eternal happiness. He is able to do all those things far beyond anything that we do. So every time you pick up your cell phone, think about God's technology and how much greater it is. And pray to the God who hears because he really does hear. Jesus believed in the power of prayer. He realized that no matter the chaos and confusion of earth's problems, that you can find God's solution in prayer. What was Jesus praying about? I believe he was praying for two or three things. He was praying for courage to walk towards God. Calvary's cross. He was praying for the crowds of people that hadn't totally understood the reason that he'd come to reach the lost. And then he was praying for his disciples. Not just the 12, but all of his disciples 2,000 years later that we would understand who he is and what he's all about. I love this part of the story. It says, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And I shared last evening that I'm from St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada, the most easterly point in North America, out in the Atlantic Ocean out where the Titanic hit an iceberg off the coast of our province in 1912. And I had the privilege of serving there as a pastor. I served there as the president. And I remember this story. I entered into a little community called Red Harbor. It had a population of 300. And I went there to visit someone. I discovered that they were out with a group of fishermen having a scoff having a meal together. They were boiling potatoes and they were eating a black bird. The meat looked like as black as that speaker. And when I went in there, there were about a dozen fishermen there and they began to ask me questions. And I had no idea what they were saying because I was from the city and they were from these little fishing villages, and they had their own lingo, their own language. And so if they were to describe what the disciples were going through, here's how they would say it. They say, what is it that you from the north? Did you get that? 
Bill, you got it? Let me slow it down for you. They'd say, bye, there's a tizzard blowing from the north. A blizzard, a tizzard, a storm blowing from the north. And that's how the disciples were feeling. And that's maybe how we are beginning to feel with the uncertainty all around us and the stormy winds of war and inflation and pandemics and who knows what's coming next. They were out there on the sea and the wind was contrary and the waves were coming in over their boat. They were in a tizzard. And then it says this, and it is amazing what it says, and it's very important for you to consider today. It says, and in the fourth watch of the night, between 3 and 6 a.m., Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. So here we are now. I'm guesstimating that there are 250 to 300 people here, maybe even more. But every single one of us has to choose whether we believe that or not. Do you understand what I'm saying? Every single one of us has to say, do I believe what's written in this book or not? Because there are a lot of dissenting voices, in fact, so much so that one day I was driving down the road in my car and I listened to the news and after the newscast, a commentary came on and here's what they said. They said, those Christians who believe that Jesus walked on water, they are ridiculous. And the person said, well, what do you mean? And the other person commentating said, he did not walk on water, he walked on ice. That's what he said. And I said, whoa, scratch my head. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Because it did not explain to me why the disciples were rowing on ice. <laughs> and then I said to myself, well, that means that Jesus was slender. Because he walked on the ice Peter must have been a lot heavier. He fell through the ice. There are a lot of people that share a lot of things out there today. And we as Seventh-day Adventists have been people of what? The book. Are we still people of the book? One of the crazy ideas that I've been sharing, and I don't know if it's going to take traction or not, but I share it because I have nothing to lose. I've invited the entire Upper Columbia Conference to pray for 40 days because I believe in the basics. There's no sense for me or anyone else to come and have this office. You notice I don't even mention the name of it. I couldn't care less about it. Titles mean nothing. There's only one person who has a title. Who is that? Jesus. It's all about Jesus. But if we want to be alive, if we want to grow spiritually, we need Jesus. And so I'm inviting the Upper Columbia Conference and you, if you haven't been participating, I'm inviting you today when you go home, tomorrow morning when you kneel down, pray and say, God, I actually want to see your incredible, miraculous vision happen in the Upper Columbia Conference, so I'm joining the movement. And I'm gonna pray. Well, how long does it take you to pray that prayer? seconds. But when you begin to get into that zone, you say, you know, Lord, I, I need to pray for my son who's drifted away. I need to pray for the person in the church who's battling cancer. I need to pray for my coworker that I work with each day. And all of a sudden, you begin to change. And then you know what my other dream is, and I don't know if it's going to happen. But here goes. I'm inviting every pastor inviting every pastor in every church in the Upper Columbia Conference, and this is crazy, to preach through, teach through, and encourage all the members of the Upper Columbia Conference to read through the entire Bible together in 2023. Because I know after 36 years of ministry, that when people pray believing, 
And when they get into the word of God, that hearts and lives are changed, and the Holy Spirit begins to move on the children, on the parents, on the grandparents, on everyone in the building, and all of a sudden there's this groundswell that happens in their hearts, and they've got to tell people about what they're reading and what they're experiencing, and so they move out like an army. And they begin to reach out to lost men and women and boys and girls for the kingdom. And I don't know how many churches are going to grab hold of that. But I'm casting that vision. Been there. Done it before. I know that when we build on the foundation of prayer and the word of God and we say it's all about Jesus, everything changes. And we actually believe that he can walk on water. And if we believe that he can walk on water, if we believe that he can turn the temperature down in a little boy's body from 20 miles away, if we believe that he can create this world simply by speaking, then what can he do in Sandpoint in 2022 when we actually believe that he can go out into that community and he can touch people's hearts through the power of his Holy Spirit without us even doing anything yet? And he can be preparing the heart soil so that when we do go, we're able to reach out to lost men and women and boys and girls like never before. But it's based on this foundation, prayer and getting into the Word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to change us so that we get serious about the second coming. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit! And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto, the same, spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. If you're going through a storm in your life right now, or when you go through a storm, look up to the God who cares because he really does care for you and me. Secondly, pray to the God who hears, because he really does hear and answer every single prayer. And thirdly, no matter what, be of good cheer. Jesus says, it is I. Be not afraid. No matter what comes upon this world, if you have Jesus Christ, it makes all the difference. Better to be sailing on the sea of life with Jesus in the boat than to be sailing on the sea of life all by yourself. We need to uplift Jesus Christ every Sabbath morning. I like to compare each church in the Upper Columbia Conference to a ship. Ellen White says, stay on board the ship. Seas are going to get very stormy to the point where it seems like the ship might sink. But we need to remember who's captain of the ship. Jesus is the captain of the ship. And he will sail the ship safely through to the heavenly harbor. But I don't want to go to the heavenly harbor unless there's a long line of people behind me that I can hug and say, wow, we've journeyed together and they've come into the church in multiplicities of ways to be saved by grace through faith in Jesus because we've been able to share that good news. And so you know what I picture? That's why I say you need to go to two and three services. I want the ship to be so full, every ship in the Upper Columbia Conference to be so full that there are people hanging over the sides and up the mast and, and everywhere. We need to help lost men and women and boys and girls to get ready for the soon return of Jesus. And when we start praying, when we start getting into the Word, 
you will begin to see miracles happen with your own eyes. You will hear testimonies of how God has brought people into this church and how you as a church have only demonstrated that you are ready to receive them. And when we're sailing on that ship with Jesus towards the heavenly harbor, we'll be able to sing, it is well with my soul. I pray that right now, this very moment, that as you're sitting here, you have a smile on your face and you're able to say, yes, Jesus, it is well with my soul. I know exactly what it is that you're calling me to do. Pray, get into the word, and let the Holy Spirit show me how to reach my family, my neighbors, my friends. And when I see that happen, I'm going to laugh. I'm going to cry. And I'm going to praise you as King of kings and Lord of lords. And then I'll say, as we're entering the heavenly harbor, it is well with my soul. Please stand with us as we sing our closing song, number 530, It Is Well. for the benediction. Almighty God in heaven above, we praise you. 
we thank you. We thank you that one time we were lost, but now we've been found. We thank you that we can stand here and sing, it is well with our souls, and we know that it is only and always because of Jesus Christ, your Son. I pray a special blessing upon this Sandpoint Church, upon all of its leaders, upon every member. I pray for Pastor Michael Morehouse, who's coming to be the pastor of this church very soon. I ask, O oh Lord, now that you might already be moving through the mighty power of your Holy Spirit, not only in this place, not only in our hearts, but in the hearts of people all around this church in the community, that you might prepare the way, that you might show this church how to reach lost men and women and boys and girls for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would give them compassion and love for every single person that they meet and interact with and that they would know that everyone is a child of the heavenly king. May you allow this church, as it prays, as it enters into the Word of God, to see your miracles happen again with their own very eyes. We believe that you are going to move mightily, and we thank you in advance, just like Jesus did before performing the miracle of feeding the 15,000 plus people. Thank you for what you are going to do. Thank you for what you have done in this place and in our hearts today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit of God, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.